this out. So thank you all for coming. We're really glad you're here. And we're so delighted to welcome back Elaine Tarone. She hasn't given a talk for a couple of years. I think, Not here. At Not Carla. here. Yeah. yeah. So, so we're really delighted to have her back. For those of you who don't know Elaine, she is a professor emerita from the Second Language Education Program. And she was the Carla director for about 20 years. Yeah? Off and on. Off and on, right? So um, we're just so happy to have her here. She's also a member of the Douglas Fir Group, which is going to be the topic of her talk today. And for those of you who aren't familiar with that paper that was published in 2004, 2016. 2016, it talks about a transdisciplinary approach to applied linguistics and second language acquisition research. So that's what Elaine's going to be talking about today. And the title of her talk is The Role of Social Context in Second Language Acquisition and Use. The Douglas Fir Group. So please give a warm welcome to me. I feel like I feel like I want to have a party. I'm just seeing all these familiar faces. <laughs> like, wow, this is great. Um, this is actually a kind of autobiographical talk. It is it is drawing on my personal history in the field of second language acquisition. So I'm presuming to just go back to the beginning of my career and just. I'm viewing all of this through the lens of what I've seen in doing research on second language acquisition since 1972. So just to warn you, that's, that's my approach here. I also gave this talk twice this spring, once in Finland at the University of Vivascula and once in Norway and Stavanger. And I thought, hmm, I haven't talked to Carla for a long time. Maybe I should, I should do it here too. So that's, that's uh, this is my third time. I'm also going to present this at uh, the Maled conference. Uh, so if you're going to the Maled conference and coming to my talk, which is at the very end of the conference um, on Saturday, um, you don't have to stay, but it's the same talk. Okay. So, um, oops. All right. The other thing I'm going to tell you is I had cataract surgery, so all of a sudden I can see at a distance and not close up, which has revolutionized my life. So I'm going to uh, periodically be fumbling around with these cheaters. OK, so um, a basic question for second language acquisition research, which is research on the way human beings acquire a language after they've acquired their first language at home, when they add another language. A basic question is, when we study the way acquisition proceeds, is this uh, just a cognitive? focus, or is it a social topic um, as well? And nobody's saying it's only social, but uh, the question is, is, can we get by with just looking at the human mind, at the cognitive processes, or are we going to take into account social factors? And so uh, the question is, if you do the first thing, you're only looking at the individual mind, then you're saying, Interlanguage or learner language is what learners know, either explicitly what they can tell you about the language or uh, implicitly uh, something they know unconsciously. And then if it is that, how do researchers study it? How do researchers model the processes of acquiring a second language as this knowledge grows? Um, and this is the approach generally taken by generative linguistics or cognitive uh, psychologists, and that's so they're looking for linguistic rules or cognitive patterns. Or uh, are we st what we're studying is, are we saying that what people know about the second language is uh, systematically influenced by social variables? And by that I mean task, what you ask learners to do, or who they're talking to, the interlocutor, or the topic. So, uh, what, what I got involved in this field in the um, 1970s. I got my PhD in 1972. And that was the year I published my first paper. And that was also the year that uh, Larry Selinker, who was on my committee, as you'll see, uh, published a paper called Interlanguage. So uh, in, I'll just give you a little background. In 1968, and I know it's before many of you were born, probably, I spent a year studying applied linguistics at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. And Larry Selinker was the only other American there out of 30, 45 people probably. And he was a very eccentric visiting Fulbright scholar who had a New York accent, a very bluff style, and he was writing a paper he wanted to call Interlanguage. 
Uh, I remember him scribbling down notes at every party we went to at the pub. Everywhere he went, he was scribbling notes on little scraps of paper that he would then tape together. So this is before the internet, obviously, right? So he had this mosaic, a big square mosaic of papers, and he'd turn it, you know, to say, you know, what his latest inspiration was about the nature of interlanguage. And eventually that scrap of paper, papers, became uh, a paper published in 1972. And there's a handout if you're looking for references here. You can find where that was published. And it became the foundation for a new field of research. Because up to that point, what, what he was calling for, what he was pointing out was, a lot of people have been teaching second languages for quite a long time, but there's been essentially no research done to support the teaching approaches that people were using. People were successful, people were popular, based on the power of their personalities and convincing people to use one teaching method or another, but there wasn't research that had been done in any systematic way at that point on the way people acquired second languages, observing them over time, seeing how their language evolved and so on. So the 1972 paper, Interlanguage, was an effort to, um, to provide a framework. And basically, because Larry Selinker graduated from Georgetown and was, uh, uh, you know, he was in fact uh, coming out of a linguistics department, he took a cognitive and a generative, linguistic generative frame of reference. So he tried to frame it as a linguistics issue. Um, the proposal was that what learners were producing was systematic. So it was a linguistically systematic grammar, and you could describe it with linguistic rules. It was one that would obey language universals, even as it evolved over time in the general direction of the target language. So over time, the learner's language would sound more and more native-like. Right? So this was a construct that was created with a only solely cognitive, solely linguistic frame. I mean, basically, what happened was that, importantly, um, you're looking at categorical linguistic rules. Importantly, interlanguage can only be inferred, according to Selinker, not on the basis of what learners say are the grammatical rules, but rather the language they actually produced when they're focused on meaning. Right? So uh, it rehearsed speech, drills, grammar practice tells us nothing about interlanguage. It tells us nothing about the language that they actually produce when they're talking about meaningful things. Uh, as Larry's student, I asked lots of questions about this. Then this paper is full of footnotes that quote comments made by his students. Those are on the little scraps of paper. So you'll see personal communication, Tyrone. Tyrone says, how can they be categorical when the language changes? <laughs> when they move from inside the classroom and out. So there are lots of comments, uh, and it's a very complicated paper and almost impossible to read start to finish because of the way it was written. But um, the <laughs> uh, early on then in 1979, the, one of the earliest papers I wrote was Interlanguage as Chameleon. So what I was saying there was that as a natural language, I would assume that inner language is not just in the head. So it is an inherently systematically variable system. When learners move from one social context to another, the grammar may sh change. They can be very accurate in the lab and walk out in the hall and violate and completely change grammar rules when talking about something else. <coughs> so that was something that, um, that was proposed. So these are both propositions, and this was like early in the field, in the early 1970s, there was this division. Is learner language just in the head, or is it also social? So some of the earliest research that came out during the 70s actually argued that inter learner language is social. And one of the earliest ones, actually also published in 1972, was a paper by Alexander Giora. He was a psychiatrist at the University of Michigan, and you'll see in the, um, a, a number of his graduate students co-authored this with him. Um, and what he argued was, all right, um, 
learners are going to shift the way they pronounce a second language depending on the degree to which they empathize with the person they are talking to at the moment. So he had this idea that as individuals, we have a language ego. We have something that is a construct, it, how we define our identity, if you will. So he was saying, well, your identity obviously matters. And if you are speaking to somebody who has, let us say, is a speaker of Thai, and his research was on the, the production of Thai as a second language. If you are speaking to somebody you really empathize with, your pronunciation is going to get better and better. It's going to get more like the pronunciation of the person you're talking to, if you really identify with and like that person. So this is the guy who did the famous alcohol studies. And unfortunately, they were so controversial, we only remember the alcohol studies, but not this theoretical framework, right? <laughs> Right? So what he did was say, well, let's see, I'm a psychiatrist, so I'm going to do an experiment. I need a control group, an experimental group, so how can I artificially induce empathy during a conversation? I know, a martini, right? <laughs> so, so he ran this study with half of his participants talking to speakers of Thai who had had increasing amounts of alcohol and he was very careful being a psychiatrist, experimental psychiatrist, so half an ounce of alcohol, what is their pronunciation like? An ounce of alcohol, what's it like? Ounce and a half, two ounces. They tracked this over time. And then he had a control group who drank martinis with no alcohol in them, which, you know, anyway, that, <laughs> And sure enough, what he found was that the experimental group, their, their pronunciation as judged by a neutral group of judges of Thai accent, got better after a half an ounce of alcohol. And he better after an ounce, and really good, really good after an ounce and a half. After which point, it got really bad, right? <laughs> For reasons, he said, other than empathy. Right? <laughs> so he argued, they argued that this was evidence that, in fact, empathy with people you are talking to, a social factor, was absolutely critical for the, your success in learning to pronounce a second language. So it's clearly, clearly, even in the same year that Seneca's proposal came out with a cognitive idea that what learners are doing is systematic, at the same time, people are saying, well, social factors are really important, right? He tried to replicate the study later with Valium, but that didn't work. <laughs> and then, then the IRB cracked down, so there's been nothing else like that since. Um, so, so the basic idea with a lot of these studies assumed that social context does cause variation in the language that learners produce. And so uh, Lana Dickerson, and actually this is 1975, 74 was her dissertation, but uh, she published about it in T Cell Quarterly in 75, and it's a very careful study showing sociolinguistic variation using a Varbrill model to say, show that uh, the task that you're performing affects the accuracy of your pronunciation, right? So when you are, um, you know, focus, relax, focused on meaning, you get one set of pronunciation forms. When you're focused on trying to be accurate, you get something else. Uh, Evelyn Hatch, in 1978, in her book, Discourse Analysis, followed Skolan, and she was sh showing that if you look at the way learners interact with speakers of the language they're acquiring, that what she documents is, in fact, scaffolding, uh, showing that uh, there's co-construction with an interlocutor of the factors of the sentence that the learner is in the process of acquiring. And so um, more recently, there are people like Lantoff and Swain who've talked about that within a, a Vygotskian framework. But she had brilliant data in 1978, and you can go look at those studies. These are all studies that her MA students did, and so she published them in this book, and they're really nice case studies of uh, individuals in interaction. And then, um, and then I wrote this paper, Interlanguage as Chameleon. Leslie Beebe, the year after, published, again, uh, uh, research done with learners of Thai. I don't know why, during this decade, people were so interested in English speakers learning Thai, but they were. 
And what she found was, again, that uh, in cons consistent with what uh, Giora found, that when uh, learners of Thai were interacting with people who were, who were ethnically Thai, they, their pronunciation was more Thai, more like Thai. And she was very, um, she has a lot of very good data on that. At the same time, there were people doing cognitive stuff, looking at grammar and sentence level grammar, and totally uh, ignoring social context. So right from the very get-go, there were these two strands of research looking at the way we acquire second languages, one of them uh, totally ignoring social context, and the other is carefully documenting the impact of social context. <clears throat> okay. So an important question, this is a very important question for language teaching, lest you think it's some esoteric thing that researchers only care about. Um, if, in fact, learning a second language is just cognitive, so it's a logical operation just in your head, then to teach a second language, that should be just a cognitive logical process. And so what you would do is explicitly teach grammar rules and words, and learners would focus on those, and they would memorize them, and they might, they might do it over a computer program. You're sitting in a room somewhere, there's no, no, just you're alone, right, in a room. So then you should be able to learn that language. And in that model, you've learned the language if you can show you know what you know. Do you know those words? Do you know that grammar? And actually using the rules and using the words to communicate would be irrelevant, right? Irrelevant. Or if, in fact, learning a second language is part of an interaction between your mind, your body, and the social context and the people that you know, then teaching a second language has to have both. You have to do more than just teach the words and, and the rules. You, you're going to be acquiring the language through using it in social interaction with valued others. I have a three-year-old granddaughter. That's what she's doing to learn English. That's how you learn your first language, is through using it, right? Children do not memorize grammar rules and, and words, right? They use the language and it evolves. So uh, you know you've learned the language if you can use it to communicate with others. So in the 80s then, uh, what happened was that there evolved sort of core research. And I would say it's fair to say that the mainstream of SLA research was cognitive, right? Um, People focused on talking about interlanguage grammars in the abstract. They looked at the sequence of acquisition of linguistic morphemes, negation, questions. Not a peep about social context, right? It's just, do you know it, right? Um, following a linguistic theory of uh, generative linguistics, uh, the goal of interlanguage study was to document systematic change over time in learner grammars. So you got idea, uh, theories of universal sequences of acquisition of morphemes, negation, and questions. People were really interested in universals, what holds across all learners. And so people would track input versus output. Not so core were the researchers who were still interested in social context. Me, Leslie Beebe, Miriam Eisenstein, um, trying to show that these morphemes shifted back and forth. Um, as, as the task of the interlocutor shifts. It's very inconvenient that that happens. Uh, it's messy. Uh, people didn't want to hear it, I think. Um, uh, in response, there were, there were some researchers early on who claimed that there was no such thing as variation. It was a myth. It was just a kind of a performance factor. There was no evidence that learners shifted in that way. So the 1988 book that I wrote just documented all the research that had been done up to that point that actually showed that learners' language shifts in response to interlocutor, task, what, whatever the factors were. Now, one of the things that happened in the 80s, for me personally, was that I became editor of Applied Linguistics. And so in that volume, along, uh, as editor along with Henry Widdowson and Bernard Spolsky, we published 
research studies in both strands. So we published studies that took a strictly cognitive orientation, linguistic orientation, and also studies that took a, a, a social one. Miriam Eisenstein, 1989, actually published two books uh, featuring research on, that took a sociolinguistic and variationist approach. Uh, in 1985, Larry Selinker, along with a guy named Dan Douglas, wrote a paper in applied that we published in Applied Linguistics called Wrestling with Context in Interlanguage Theory. So this is a product of lots of discussions that I had had with him and others as well. And he was coming around, right? And so he was saying, oh yeah, well we do notice that when we teach graduate students, ESL, that uh, engineering graduate students we've observed when they're talking about their, their field of study, they have, their grammar is pretty good. And they're fluent and these ITAs, international TAs, uh, sounded pretty proficient. But when we asked them to talk about another topic, like how do you make that dish your, your mother made when you were a kid, it, it falls apart, right? They have their grammar totally shifts, right? So this is an effort by, by a theoretical linguist, or a structural linguist probably more, uh, to wrestle with the whole idea of how do we factor in context then, right? What does it mean that you know something in the second language and it shifts like this? And how do we model that? Lots of questions. And in fact, I have said that everything that Larry Selinker ever writes is really a series of questions. Uh, it, it, you, can't, you can't think of it as assertions. It's like, what if, right? All right, then in the 90s, uh, early 90s, um, people started talking about the SLA wars, right? And by that they meant direct conflict between these two strands. So in 89 and 90, some cognitive and generative SLA researchers started to say, the field of SLA is too disorganized. Um, there's only, we need only one theory, right? Uh, let a thousand flowers bloom, no. Only one flower is going to bloom in our field, and it's going to be ours, right? <laughs> ours. Our theory is the correct one, and it was, and they started directly attacking others. So uh, Kevin Gregg famously published a whole series of papers about this time. The first one was attacking Krashen, Krashen's monitor model, and everybody was at attacking Krashen at the time. So called Krashen Bashen by people <laughs> doing it. And they said, oh, you know, this isn't really a theory. There are all these problems. And, and so it just got really hot for crashing in SLA. But then Kevin Gregg published a second paper attacking John Schumann's theory. And third, right after a baby of mine was born, he attacked mine, right? <laughs> so, which I thought was ungentlemanly because I couldn't really respond very fast. Um, but, but he just basically took on one approach after another that was not a transformational generative approach to SLA and just said, this is why this is just, there's no evidence for it. And one of the biggest criticisms for all of them was that there weren't longitudinal studies of large numbers of learners, right? 93, Beretta and Greg, by this time I was not the editor of Applied Linguistics, but they produced a special issue of Applied Linguistics that called to eliminate all explanations of SLA except theirs, and they said, let a couple of flowers bloom, right? So every, every issue, every, every paper in this issue is, is taking this same approach. In 1997, uh, Michael Long uh, published a couple of papers arguing that context, social context, only affects second language performance, but it doesn't affect what people know, right? So if you ask people to say the rule in any, whether at the bus stop or in the class, they'll tell you what the rule is, that doesn't change. And that's all that matters to him. So if, if you're, what you're, the rules you actually use when you're out in different social contexts shift, that's just performance. It has nothing to do with what you know. So it's straight out of transformational generative theory. And one of my favorite paper is a working paper at Hawaii where he says, SLA is an internal process. 
And like all human internal processes, these are unaffected by social context. And he listed examples of internal processes not affected by social context, like digestion, or my favorite, sexual arousal. And I'm like, that's a bad example. <laughs> that one is a bad example. He actually said that. <laughs> so, and he did point out the studies that had been published up to that po point were not longitudinal. The ones that showed variation, right? They were just at a single point in time. But they didn't show how change over time might be affected by this shifting. And that was a really good point, right? That was a very good point, I thought. Um, a, right after he said that, where we had a discussion, uh, <laughs> uh, okay, I'm not going to detour of it. Um, what happened about this time was that the journals began to diverge in the kind of study they published. So Studies in Second Language Acquisition was publishing transformational generative and cognitive studies, pretty much only. If you submitted a paper that, to them that was not that kind of study, they didn't publish it. Right? And at the same time, applied linguistics and modern language journals started publishing more social. They published a broader spectrum of, um, of studies. In the late 90s, uh, publications began, uh, there was a kind of counterattack. People started writing papers to, to hit back against this very strong, and people argued too narrow, uh, attempt to control ideas in the field words like Nazi were flung around in private, but that, right. So what happened was uh, in 95, this is right after, right about the time that Long was arguing context has no impact, uh, Guo Chiang Liu came to the University of Minnesota with a longitudinal study of a learner that clearly documented ways in which social context was affecting his acquisition over time. It was a two-year study. And he wanted to publish about it. At the end of the year, we ended up co-authoring co it. Um, so that's the Toronto View study. Uh, Long started saying, well, there's no evidence except for that one case study that Toronto View did. But that's only one study, he said. We need major studies. It's been hard to get funding in this field. We had there were very few grants to gather data. Everything was pretty much doctoral dissertation, sort of people working you know, on the side, but no major funding for research in this area. Uh, about this time, 96, Lantoff uh, uh, edited an issue of language learning talking about sociocultural theory and Vygotskyan theory. He had been way on the sidelines up to this point. People thought he was eccentric basically. Uh, and then uh, Meryl Swain began to join him in supporting this approach and he began to get more credibility. But fields, fields like ours are social, right? There are certain people that are popular and others that are not and it isn't always fair. Uh, it isn't always logical. Um, but it's interesting to watch the way in which sociocultural theory was just given no credibility at all in the 70s and 80s, and then mid-90s, it begins to get some, some traction. Firth and Wagner in 1997 wrote a famous paper now, one that's now famous in the Modern Language Journal, saying we need, you know, for teachers, for practical purposes, social context needs to be a factor that we think about. It is not enough to just ignore it. Um, and then uh, in 2000, I wrote a reprise of that uh, Selinker paper, revisiting what is the role of context in second language acquisition. Um, then in the 2000s, there was an increasing push for multiple, multiple perspectives. Uh, Sally Magnin was editor of the Modern Language Journal in mid-90s to 2007. And of course, she's the one who published the Firth and Wagner paper, right? It was a follow-up issue 10 years later, 2007. So what do we know about social context? So the role of editors of journals here, I think is really, really important, right? Because Sally Magnin was open to this, suddenly people were talking about it. And with journals that were not publishing it, 
those people were not talking about it. So the field kind of still persisted in a, in a separate way. 2003, Block wrote a book called The Social Turn. 2007, there was a symposium in Auckland, New Zealand on multiple perspectives to SLA. Same year, at AAAL, Gass and Mackey, who were, had been doing their work primarily in what I would call a cognitive framework, not social, they had a symposium on multiple perspectives. So this, the whole field is beginning to say, no, we don't like this only t a couple flowers bloom stuff, right? Uh, we want to inc broaden what counts as research on second language acquisition. After Magnan left as editor of the Modern Language Journal, uh, Leo Van Leer was editor for four years and tragically died in 2012. Um, and Heidi Burns took over. And basically, if you know Heidi Burns, she's an energetic, uh, opinionated person who was a strong proponent for social approaches to SLA. And she, she, for the time when she was the editor of MLJ, as you'll see, played a very strong role in trying to get more attention paid to alternatives to generativist and cognitivist theories. Um, lots more publications came out, books, uh, lots of articles published in the Modern Language Journal, and publications began to explore issues like the, what is the role of emotion, right? What is the role of emotion in acquiring a second language? What about embodiment? So how, how, how does the state, how, how do we embody the acquisition of language? And so you started seeing studies on gesture and the way that gesture and stress are related. Um, Translanguaging, usage-based and systemic functional linguistics. Systemic functional is something that Heidi Burns particularly promoted. And then increasingly, there were more learners of second languages who were not schooled. And so uh, study of the acquisition processes of non-literate, non-schooled learners fit nicely into this framework because the study of uh, rules and the disembodied rules requires literacy, right? Um, so about this time, uh, a group of SL, so I'm, I'm really happy about this, as you can well imagine, because I felt like I'd been saying this for a long time and everyone sort of ignored it. So gosh, this is great, good, right? Um, then uh, a group of SLA researchers starting about 2007, eight began to meet together. And this is a group of researchers who had different theoretical approaches, but they shared a common commonality, which is they rejected this cognitive model of SLA. And they started to say, what are some principles we can all affirm that would strengthen our common position? Can we meet together and hash this out and say, what are we doing here? Uh, how can we strengthen our position that social factors are important? So in 2009, Dwight Atkinson had a colloquium at AAAL is the American Association for Applied Linguistics in Denver. And he published the results of that in 2011. You can read it, it's in your references. And then in 2013, at Penn State, which was where Jim Lantoff is a faculty member, Jim Lantoff and Dwight Atkinson organized a two-day meeting, and they got grants from Penn State, and they got Heidi Burns to support them, and they paid for people to come to Happy Valley in Penn State and talk, right? And I was one of those people, which is very cool. And then in 2014, the next year, we had a meeting at the American Association for Applied Linguistics meeting in Portland. We happened to meet in the conference hotel and the name of the room we were scheduled into was the Douglas Fir Room. And so uh, <laughs> Heidi Burns got funding from MLJ uh, to, and the basic uh, call was, can you write a credo for the journal about what are we doing when we look at the role of social context and can we do this in a consistent way? And so we met for two days in the Douglas Fir Room, and I'd say probably the first hour was a discussion, what are we gonna call ourselves? 
<laughs> and this was a sad result, in my opinion. It was better than the Happy Valley group, but other. <laughs> Okay, and the result is in your handout. So there's a framework there, and there's a, there's a visual model. And so who were these people? Who were these people who met first at Penn State and then in, in uh, the Douglas Fir Room? So there were proponents of sociocultural theory. So Jim Lantoff was there and his student, Eduardo Negrarela, who now is a faculty member in Florida, and Meryl Swain. And then Patsy Duff was there talking about language socialization theory. Bonnie Norton was there talking about social identity theory. Diane Larson Freeman was there talking about complexity and dynamic systems theory. Lourdes Ortega and Nick Ellis both talked about usage-based linguistics. John Schumann, uh, uh, was there talking about a biocultural perspective. He's very interested in brain research and emotion, right? Dwight Atkinson, sociocognitive approaches. I was there still talking <laughs> forever, only talking about variation of sociolinguistics. And Heidi Burns and Meredith Duran talked about systemic functional linguistics. Joan Kelly Hall from Penn State talking about conversation analysis. Those are the people that the organizers invited, right? It was kind of arbitrary. It's like, there, here's this group. So one of the things that we talked about was this is not a closed group. It can't be a closed group. It's kind of accidental that we're all here. So we want to write this um, paper, this, this statement, which Heidi said, I'll publish it. That's what you do when you're the editor of a journal, right? You just say, do you guys develop it? I will publish it. It's like, oh, OK, good. So all of those people are the authors of that paper. So this is a committee. This is a committee trying to agree and write a paper. You can imagine. I mean, it's, it's, it was organic. <laughs> it's an organic process. I'm just happy to be there, right? Because I'm like, oh, look, everyone's talking about social context. Isn't that cool, right? So this is the framework that, that uh, that they came up with. So you've got a macro level, so you want to include what's happening in the society at large, what's the power structure, what's going on with the laws in the country, and what are the political values, talk about religious values, so these big issues. And then a meso level, so within that, the ideological structures, within that, uh, for the teaching learning situation, you have institutions and communities. So. Social identities, uh, Bonnie Norton's investment in agency and power, her issues come in there. Then you have families and schools and neighborhoods and places of work. So you have genre analysis was always about places of work. How do people talk in their places of work? Um, places of worship, social organizations. And then at the micro level, now you're down to looking at individuals engaging with other individuals, right? Maybe they're from the same communities or different. And then now we're going to look at what do these individuals have as, as resources to make meaning, semiotic resources. So linguistic is just one, right? So now the linguistic, which used to be the center, right, is one of many uh, uh, semiotic resources. Then prosodic, so stress and intonation, interactional skills, nonverbal skills, gesture, Graphic, visuals, pictorial. <sighs> of course, we had to do a pictorial visual of this, right? So, there, so this thing was like emerged as a piece of art up on the wall with, on a whiteboard. And let's scratch this out. And you forgot about nonverbal, right? So it was really exciting and fun, but a little worrying. Because, <laughs> again, it was organic. And then the neurobiological mechanisms, because we, John Schumann was there, that got in, right? So this paper sort of reflects what all of the people in the room were studying and trying to see how does this fit together, right? How, do, how does what Bonnie, Bonnie Norton is doing, how does that work with what John Schumann's doing and that, how does that fit with everybody else's? And so it was uh, really wonderful, actually, a very uh, exciting, thing to do, and uh, you can read it in the Modern Language Journal 2016 issue, because Heidi published it. So here are the 
10 themes that people said we can all agree on. So language competencies are complex, dynamic, and holistic. So that it's not linguistic competence a la Chomsky. Right? Uh, language learning is a semiotic process. It involves nonverbals, turn-taking, collocations. It's situational, intentionally and socially gated. So we have to think about social roles and pragmatics. It's multimodal, it's embodied. Gesture is a key part of that. Um, literacy and instruction are important. They mediate language learning. We are dealing, the whole, the, whole, the whole context that justifies this paper at the beginning is saying, look, the world has changed since Larry Selinker wrote that paper. In 1972, there were no immigrants learning, basically no immigrants, not large numbers. So it was all about international students at the university. How do we describe their learning? But now, now the world is like, people are moving, right? They aren't just immigrating. They are moving transnationally. So how do we talk about multilingualism in a transnational, constantly moving world? The world has changed. How do we think about our study of how people become multilingual and, and what are the forces that impl influence that? Um, variability and change are at the heart of language learning. Yay, says Elaine. Uh, literacy and instruction, yes. Language learning is identity work, right? That's Bonnie Norton's voice. But think about it. That 1972 study by Giora about identity, right? And, and willingness to empathize with other people and shift your identity. That was there from the beginning. This is not new, right? It's just getting credibility, finally. Agency and transformative power are means and goals for language learning. Ideology permeates all levels. Emotion and affect matter at all levels. So we're not just talking about cognition. Now, this paper came out, and the first thing that happened was, why weren't we invited, right? <laughs> How come you guys got to write that paper and we didn't, right? And even people like Sue Gass, who, who does cognitive work, she's like, how come I wasn't invited? She, yeah, but <laughs> you haven't talked about social context, right? That's, you know, it's, yeah, well, we're, we're, so, so all of that got talked about at conferences. And like-minded people, as well as generative, um, so the question would be, what would be some next steps? How can we broaden this out? So there was, of course, another meeting. <laughs> um, I, over a year ago, at the AAAL 2018 meeting in Chicago, there was another meeting, again commissioned by Heidi Burns, and Patsy Duff uh, co-organized it with her. And all the authors who were at the first couple of meetings were invited to contribute. Only some responded. Some of them said, I'm done, right? <laughs> right? But some said, yeah, I'll come. And then other people came who said, well, I wasn't there. I want my voice to be part of this next uh, discussion. Um, the basic thing was, this was in March of 2018, and Heidi, who's a very organized person with a forceful personality, said, you can submit a paper I will publish it in January 2019, but you have to get it in, you know, in one month, right? You've got to write it, and you've got to write it now, and you have to write it in time for other people to read it and have comments. So it was like a lightning fast process that she set up. Not everybody who was there could do it, but the idea was to have five core papers and then critical commentaries as well. So it ended up with position papers by Patsy Duff, and Patsy talked more about language socialization. Uh, Lourdes Ortega. So uh, let's see. Let's see if I can find this. I can read it. So Lourdes said, I want to study social justice. I want to write about social justice and the study of multilinguals, because that was not dealt with in that first paper. So these were people saying, I have more to say. Uh, Nick Ellis. Uh, wrote about cognition, and he said, look, current research on the brain is not disembodied, right? People who study the brain now are really interested in social context, as it turns out, and the impact of body, 
and social context on the way the brain works. So our idea that studying the brain is like necessarily not social, that was an older approach, but not now, says Nick. And so he summarized, this is a great paper, by the way, it's a great paper on cognitive psychology and the way in which our understanding of the human brain has changed. And now we see it as social and see it as affected by the body that it is in, um, which changes everything, of course. Uh, Larson Freeman, Diane wrote about agency in dynamic systems theory. Um, the learner is not passive, the learner takes action. Joan Kelly Hall wrote about uh, conversation analysis and usage-based linguistics. And then um, uh, Darren Lescott and I were there, and we had a study we had done that we thought fit well, well with this new framework. And so we talked about it, and what was cool was Darren was the only teacher there. So the researchers say, we, we really need a voice from teachers and they'd all look at Darren. And they said, then they would say, yeah, and we're really older. We need more younger people, and they'd look at Darren. <laughs> so it's like they knew, that, and we need a study, right? Something concrete. What is this, all these airy-fairy ideas, you know, what would a study look like? And we're like, we've got one, right? So we're the only research study in that whole issue. And what we're trying to do in that is just say, this is a way of looking at something within this framework. And I can say more about that study, but you've heard me talk about that before, I think, anyway. Then uh, there were uh, comments, commentaries. Dwight Atkinson, uh, May talked about the intractability of a monolingual elitist disciplinary bias. So <laughs> May said, all this work sounds really great. It's never going to change anything. He said, it's just too set in stone. So the, he had his voice. <laughs> Um, Senos and Gorter talked about multilingual repertoires in translanguaging and social context. Holt talked about nexus analysis focused on social action. Um, we actually had a generative linguist who said, but I still, <laughs> but I still believe in, in, in generative uh, approaches to SLA. So she talked about that approach, which totally ignored social context, right? So she has a paper in there. Right, so her voice is heard, and so on. So this was, um, this was the most recent one. It just came out this year. Um, in January, January of 2019. So Modern Language Journal has this as well. Okay, so uh, it's not done. Modern Language Journal says they want more position papers on this topic. If, if you think of something that hasn't been covered, um, people want submissions to Modern Language Journal. They would love to see submissions in this area. What issues that fit into this framework have been left out? Um, what are the implications for teaching? And that's a huge issue because if now it's fairly clear that there's this growing consensus that it isn't enough to just teach the grammar, even though that's what the tests test in a disembodied way. Um, but the research increasingly is supporting an approach that is uh, really integrated and whole body approaches to teaching. So uh, there's a lot of interest in teaching approaches that fit this model. So um, I'm just going to end with this, with an invitation that you consider submitting something to the Modern Language Journal. It's a new editor now, but uh, she's very sympathetic, we're told. She's not the organizer that Heidi Burns is, so we don't have any more meetings uh, to, to, uh, to do this. But uh, the journal itself is really um, a place that's really trying to promote this approach. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Observations? Yeah, so we're at the end of the time, but if anyone wants to go out, we can take a couple of questions. Okay. This whole thing has been just a gift to me at the end of my career, I have to say. I, I'm trying not to gloat, but... <laughs>
I know it's going to swing back. The, the pendulum will swing back because that's what pendulums do. But I mean, for now, it's nice to have um, an interest in in this top in these topics. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, actually. It's so much in process. Um, it, it seems as if there is, uh, it seems as if there is not much familiarity among some of the people who are coming in to do research now with anything to do with linguistics. So it's almost like the, uh, the focus on the structure of language is in danger of being lost as you get more interested in interactions and conversation. But like, what does this mean for learning how to use past tense, right? Or, or in a clear way, not necessarily native like, but just clearly, right? So the, it seems to me there is a need for more conversation because people are interested in language per se and then the whole influence of, of social context on it. And that's sort of where we, we are, I think, right now. Because people tend to just talk to people they agree with. We see this in a lot of areas of society. And so trying to, trying to promote dialogue across these different um, divides is really important. OK, well, thank you for your patience very much. Thank you.